Hello everyone, thank you for coming to my talk, How Cortex Became a Community. This is a talk that I'm really passionate about. Um, yeah, let's just dive in. So I'm Gautam, uh, I'm a senior software engineer at Grafana Labs and I've been involved in the Prometheus community for about five years now. I started off um, using Prometheus while I was doing an internship and then I did my Google Summer of Code with Prometheus contributing to its storage engine. But for the past three years, I've been working on this other CNCF project called Cortex, uh, which we use at Grafana Labs to provide a hosted Prometheus service. I was also one of the initial co-authors of Grafana Loki, a log aggregation system inspired by Prometheus and Cortex. And I've seen Loki go from launch to a huge community, a huge user base. And yeah, that's, that's pretty interesting. Cool. Before we dive into it, I just want to cover a little bit about Cortex uh, and the history of Cortex. Cortex is a horizontally scalable multi-tenant version of Prometheus, or it implements the Prometheus APIs. Uh, it's about five years old now. It started off in June 2016, and quite recently it uh, became a CNCF incubating project. So it was started off at Weaveworks to power its SaaS. Weaveworks was creating Weave Cloud and they wanted to give all their users a hosted Prometheus solution. So it started out uh, by uh, at Weaveworks. It had a few early adopters in EA, Maya Cloud, and a couple of others. Uh, and then later Grafana Labs started contributing to Prometheus, started offering a hosted Prometheus solution. And today uh, it is being run by tens of companies. I think I know of 25 companies that are running, uh, running Cortex uh, and it is powering their mission critical monitoring systems. Cool, with that context, I'm gonna go into a little numbers. So Cortex started off somewhere in 2016. I'm not even going to cover that graph. Let's start somewhere in end of 2017 and you can see it's pretty flat. But in the recent years, there's been a huge spike and the community has been growing over time. This becomes a lot more apparent if you look at the number of contributors that are contributing every month. So it's, it was roughly around 10 contributors. Uh, and then in 2019, once we joined the CNCF, it started going up and there's been a huge spike. And in Jan 2021, we had 75 uh, unique contributors in that month, which is kind of crazy to be honest. And I really absolutely love this go uh, growth. We also have a huge growth in the adoption. Uh, you can see this, these are the public uh, adopters list we have. And we have a, a lot of big names like Etsy, uh, Gojek, DigitalOcean, EA, and also quite recently we've added AWS. AWS is using Cortex to power its hosted Prometheus service, a AWS managed Prometheus. Yeah. So th while these are just 15 companies that, uh, that are public, they, I've also been speaking to a lot of other companies, a lot of banks uh, and enterprises that can't make their Cortex usage public. And I think I know more than 25 companies overall that are using Cortex in production, which is kind of crazy. So why this talk? If you see the numbers, the numbers are actually not that big, but we're actually prou quite prou proud of the numbers we have and the adoption that we saw. And over time, we've experimented with a lot of things and we've noticed that some things contributed a lot to the growth while some other things did not. And we've tried to do the same thing with Loki uh, and we saw incredible adoption in Loki. And over, over time, I think I had this playbook in my mind as to, okay, what should open source projects do if they want to have more users, have more maintainers, have more adoption. And I was talking to a couple of friends of mine who, who were uh, involved with the newer stage open source projects that were kind of struggling to build adoption. And uh, while I was giving them tips, I realized that I could give a full talk that would be useful for more open source projects. Uh, and by no means, we're not experts at this. We're still learning uh, a lot about how to build communities. And this is just a subset of the items that I think are important. If you know of other items that you think are important, please share them uh, with me after this talk. I would, I would love to write a blog post uh, or a live, live doc as to what open source projects can do. Cool, with that context, let's dive in. So this is, this is going to be obvious. Uh, documentation will break or make your project. You can build the best uh, open source system in the world, but if you don't have good documentation, nobody will use it. 
This is obvious, right? But turns out we actually didn't do a good job of it until quite recently. So we had docs, they were all in GitHub. You had to click through MD files to kind of figure out where they are. They didn't have a proper structure. And we did not have a website until December, 2019. And in December, 2019, uh, one of the low key maintainers, Cyril, who was also contributing to Cortex at that time, um, he decided to just like use one of the open source templates and create CortexMetrics.io. And this is basically when we started to focus a lot on usability and documentation. Uh, we, we kind of redid our docs, uh, we added a lot more structure. And once we've launched a website with proper docs, uh, docs, we've got a lot of feedback that it's like the change, like the usability and adoption story is like night and day. People who were struggling to use Cortex before found it much more easier to adopt and they were loving the new website. So if your project doesn't have a website, add a website, make sure the website has a search bar because people will use it. And yeah, one of the first things you need is a getting started guide. Make sure you have a very simple, very easy to use getting started guide that lets people install the system on their laptop, play around, click around, and also make sure to include a production and troubleshooting guide. The production guide will tell them, okay, this is how much you need to provision. This is, this is oh, like for this scale, these are the tweaks that you need to do and things like that. While a troubleshooting guide will be like, oh, if, if you're not seeing any of your metrics, look at these numbers or look at these logs and maybe this is the issue. So simple FAQ based based on the common requests that you get or common errors that you get, get would be quite nice. If possible, if you can have a proper page with the config file that is that describes the config file, what are the different options that you can browse and search through, that would be super helpful for users. We, we did some good job uh, automating the, the generation of this page uh, from the config object that we have. And that page has been the go-to page for a lot of people. Uh, so if you can do that, that would also be nice. So basically put the man page in the browser. Yeah, cool. So documentation is important. Again, make sure you have all these guides and make sure you have a website. This is something uh, that we've kind of learned the hard way, I would say. Uh, make sure your project is extremely easy to run. When I say extremely easy, make it really, really easy. So before May 2019, if you open the Cortex website, uh, it would show you this architecture diagram. So now this is a lot of moving parts and a lot of dependencies. Like you have to depend on a NoSQL store like Cassandra or Bigtable a console, a memcached, and possibly even an object store. And there's like a lot of these moving parts. And if you are looking for a long-term storage solution for Prometheus, and you look at this diagram, you would be immediately discouraged. But that was the reality of Cortex. Um, and there's a good reason why the Cortex, uh, Cortex architecture is this way. It's so disaggregated. Cortex runs at massive scale. We handle 20 million samples a second. Uh, we ingest and compress them, and we need to make sure that every single component that we are running is highly available and horizontally scalable. There's a reason why every one of these components exist, and we've added one more component recently because the query front end need, needed some additional features and needed to be scalable. Cool. So with that in mind, let's go back a little bit uh, to understand how Loki was built. A lot of Loki's coding was, was done on transatlantic flights. So essentially, one of, the, one of the reasons that Cortex didn't work, or like the Cortex was a little hard to adopt is, or a little hard to contribute to was, the development process was you, you, you make your changes, you write tests for it, you make sure all the tests pass, and then you had to deploy it to a remote dev environment in the cloud. This means the dev cycle was slow, and if you did not have a dev environment set up, it was kind of hard to contribute. But for Loki's case, we made sure all of Loki runs as a single binary. You do dot slash Loki, and it just simply works. There's no dependencies. It works off of, off of your file system, and you can test and play around with Loki on your laptop. This airplane mode or simplicity of Loki, and it's the same for Prometheus was a huge part of why Loki was super, uh, like w was adopted widely. And we, we've learned from that. And we focused on two things. One, making Cortex much simpler to run and reducing the dependencies that Cortex has. 
Today, if you look at the Cortex architecture, it looks something similar to this. So you do dot slash Cortex, you don't need to run 10 different microservices. All the microservices sit in a single binary. You can run multiple replicas of it. We use gossip to communicate between these replicas. Uh, so you don't need a console or an etcd. And we don't even need uh, a NoSQL store anymore. So we just write directly to an object store. Object stores are really cool because one, they're inexpensive and two, there's virtually zero configuration that you need to do. So when we made these changes, the first change moving to a single binary mode was actually a simple one, but like that improved, like that had the number of people who tried Cortex uh, increase drastically. And then once we removed the NoSQL uh, requirement, we saw bigger and bigger users start to look at and adopt Cortex. So yeah, so if you are an open source project, make it really simple to run. Just do, just create a single binary or a single, uh, single point of entry where people can just run that thing and everything is just working and try to reduce the number of external dependencies that your project has. So one of our adopters, Opstrace, uh, they wrote a blog post on why they adopted uh, Cortex and they were like, yes, we were looking uh, at possible solutions and we realized that Cortex needed to use a database like DynamoDB or Cassandra. But then one of our community members, he came in and contributed uh, a new storage engine based off our sister project, Thanos, uh, that uses simply object storage. And we spent a year optimizing uh, the engine, contributing to Thanos, contributing to Promete uh, Prometheus and Cortex to make sure that now Cortex only depends on an object store. This has increased our adoption massively. So yeah, simplify running your system. There's a good reason Cortex has all those microservices at the scale that we run. We still need a lot of those microservices, but for a lot of, lot of people, they don't have that scale and they can run a much simpler version of Cortex. So if you can simplify your project that way, try to do so. It will improve adoption. And also it will make things easier to develop. It will also improve contributions. Yeah. So one more thing I do want to cover is be accessible. So what does this mean? So I have a huge issue with Slack for community support. The problem with Slack is people ask you a question, you answer it. And then 20 days later, when someone else has the same question, they would ask it again you would, and you would answer it again. So there's no searchability here. A Google Groups mailing list is really good, which is what we use in Prometheus. Uh, Basically, when somebody asks a question, you answer it, it's persisted on Google. So next time somebody Googles the same error or same issue, they will find your answer. So while that is really cool, when your project is just starting out, it's really important that you have a sync chat system, like something like Slack. Uh, and this is even true for uh, Prometheus. When I was using Prometheus five years ago, when it was 0.8 or something, I initially asked my question on the mailing list. I got an answer. The answer was not very clear. So I immediately jumped on to IRC, which is what Prometheus uses to uh, uses uh, for community support. And I started asking people, the maintainers, their questions about it, and they could immediately answer without the latency of using a uh, mailing list. And that basically helped me fix my Prometheus issues. And that also helped them understand some of the common problems people were facing. So. If you can have a sync chat system combined with a mailing list, do that. Having said that, make sure questions don't go unanswered. When a contributor asks a question and if they don't receive a reply within a few days, it would be really discouraging. And when you have a ton of those questions and when somebody new joins the community or the channel and they see a ton of unanswered questions, it's very discouraging. So make sure all the questions that are being asked are answered, but the caveat is you should also expect to spend quite some time in the beginning, maybe 10 to 15% of your time will going will go into answering these questions. It's important and you will be doing it for a few months, but it will be giving the community such a good experience that once they have your system up and running, they're going to stick around and answer questions because that's they want to contribute back and that, that's the easiest way they could contribute back. So yeah, in, in the initial months when you launch or if you're a newer project, spend some, uh, like spend a decent amount of time answering uh, questions on Slack or whatever chat option that you choose. The other thing I want to mention is 
have regular office hours or a community call where the maintainers just jump on for 30 minutes for an hour whichever works for you and they they give the highlights uh, like what what's in the new release what are the new bugs that we fixed uh, and then open up uh, for questions from the community so this is really important for the community to have to have a space where they can directly talk to the maintainers with their with the video on uh, uh, and yeah, I would, uh, like, I would highly suggest that every project that doesn't have a community call, make a community call that is 30 minutes, at least a month, at least once a month. So that's, uh, that's really useful in Cortex. We have one, one every three weeks and we have new users jumping on all the time, telling us about their use cases. And we also have all the maintainers from different companies and time zones who are talking about different issues that they're seeing and potential fixes. So that's really cool. Um, having said that, I must warn you, the moment you launch a community call, unless you're a big project, you won't have people joining it. It will be quite lonely for a month or two. Uh, every time you post something like, I would say it will take like five community calls before people start showing up. Uh, you, but you have to consistently advertise it, post on Twitter that, okay, this month's monthly call is at X time tomorrow and things like that. So the reason for this is people who are using your project, they will keep seeing these updates and they will probably join a few a few times later. If you cancel the calls because there's no agenda, people like people won't realize that there's even a call. And this 30 minutes, uh, just hang out with your uh, maintainers and talk about random stuff if nobody shows up. But yeah, try to have a regular office hours community call. So. Yeah, the other thing I want to mention is we are doing one for Tempo and the initial thing, times, I don't think there were a lot of updates, but like recent days, a lot of uh, people are jumping in and showing uh, showing us ways of how they're using Grafana Tempo, which is another open source project that we launched. So have a community call if possible. So this is another big thing, uh, dedicate time for outreach. So by outreach, I mean, make some noise uh, about like do some marketing for your project. Like don't do vendor marketing, but like market your project, right? Regular blog posts, uh, like uh, write a blog post every month if possible and share them on social media. Twitter is a good uh, medium for this. Now you might wonder, hey, like what blog post should I write? Um, like write about the new features that came up in the last month or like if there was a release, write about what's new in the release, why that release is uh, important. Or if you found some nice performance optimization, write about the performance optimization. There's like so many things that you can write, write about different use cases people can uh, use your project with. But make sure you continuously ship, uh, like ship blog posts, uh, out about your project. This is because in the future, people are going to Google about their problems. And if you say, so people are going to Google about multi-tenancy in Prometheus. And I'm pretty sure there's like five or six blog posts that, uh, that we wrote about Cortex that are gonna show up. So they're gonna read about Cortex and then they're gonna try things out. So yeah, always try to publish a lot of blog posts. I would prefer blog posts over like conference talks and meetups uh, because they show up on Google and people can search them and it's easier to consume text. Having said that, always keep on applying to conferences and also to meetups. Like this, like good conference talks at good conferences uh, will actually uh, give you a lot of early adopters and a lot of useful feedback and contribution contributors. Meetups are the same, and I kind of prefer talking at meetups over conferences because one, the setting is a little lot more intimate, uh, even if it's an online meetup. And I feel like they, uh, there's a lot more engagement, and people will there's there's a higher chance of people going back and trying trying and running the project uh, at meetups than at conferences. Yeah, um, so a couple of advices uh, I can uh, give here is have a set of uh, slides uh, ready, like a simple pro Cortex 101 or an introduction to Cortex slide uh, that is public and that people can just copy and give conference talks at their local meetups or like local conferences. This way, it's not just you, but your community is also empowered to talk about the project that they really like about. And one of the things that we've done at Grafana Labs that I think is super cool and worked really well is we have an OKR to publish a blog post or a talk per quarter. So this essentially means if you have a team of three people, you already have a, a blog post or a talk per month, which is really cool. 
So if you can have OKRs that uh, that that have to do with outreach, try to like yeah, try to try to add the OKRs and try to see how that would work. Yeah. So yeah, so the good thing about uh, Cortex is it's just not one company who is using it. So like a lot of companies are using it, and each of them is are writing Cortex blog posts, which are really nice. Here we have an example of a blog post from VWorks, one from AWS, and one from Grafana Labs. And you can kind of see all the different ways or all the different kinds of blog posts. This is a, the first one is about a performance optimization. Uh, this is about their AWS's journey of adopting Cortex. And what the third one is like, what did we do in Cortex in 2020? So this is actually my favorite advice of all. So one of the things that I really like to do is work closely with a few users. So this gives you a lot of insight uh, and it helps you kind of improve the project a lot. So what do I mean by work closely? Uh, if possible, have a weekly call with the user. So this can be right after you launch and you're struggling to find adoption uh, and you find a user who is like, so, super seriously wanting something like your project or wanting to try that project. If they're super keen on it, set up weekly calls with them, see what they're struggling with and prioritize their, uh, their requirements uh, over yours. If possible, even create a sl shared Slack channel because they might be trying it at different times and if they can have like uh, access to you over DMs or a Slack channel over like, like a sync communication channel, that would be super useful. And this will actually help you build the right product. Um, I've done this a couple of times for a couple of projects uh, and this need not be even right after uh, you launch your project. Let's say you're working on a large feature, uh, a huge change or, or a huge performance optimization. And the kind of problems that you have are different from the problems that users have. So whenever we're doing something big, we try to find a beta user who would want, who would be okay testing it out in their environment and giving us regular feedback. So this works really, really well in optimizing documentation because they're running the project on their local system and they're going to hit issues. Uh, so it'll help you, okay, understand what are the struggles that end users face and what are, what are the problems that your project is actually having that you need to fix so that the adoption story uh, gets better. One caveat is make sure the end user that you're working with is as invested as you are. Uh, you might be wanting to help them, but like they might not have the bandwidth to do this. So it's, it's kind of really hard to find this. Uh, this is why I like meetups and conference talks. Uh, where especially meetups, you give this talk and then you, you'll, you'll likely find one person who's like super keen into trying this, testing this because they have the same problem as you. It also happens in conferences. Uh, for example, uh, I've done this with Gojek. Uh, Gojek is an Indonesian company, but it has offices, engineering offices in India. And I gave a conference talk uh, talking about Cortex and they're like, oh, we're having this issue with scaling InfluxDB and we really want to try Cortex. So I was like, hey, this is amazing. I really want to help you. Can I come to your office to give you like a tailored presentation and to kind of look at your problems? So they said, yes, I visited their uh, office a couple of times. They had a direct uh, connection to me. And as they were adopting Cortex, we had to improve our documentation, publish some of our configs to kind of uh, fix issues at scale and things like that. And I had a lot of fun working closely with the team and improving the documentation and the adoption story over a couple of months. And one of the really cool things is, this is Ankit, you see in the picture, he's part, he was part of the Gojek team. And now he shifted from Gojek to a company in Berlin and he moved to Berlin. And now we are really good friends and we hang out all the time. Like open source helped me made a lot, make a lot of friends. And Ankit is just one, uh, like one of those amazing friends I made through open source, which is super cool. Yeah. so. If possible, try to work with one or two companies. Uh, like you won't get a lot uh, out of it, but it'll help you improve your product, build the right features, and also ask them if they want to do a conference talk or a case study with you afterwards. So that brings me to my final uh, uh, final piece of advice is do case studies. So basically case studies uh, are 
documents where end users outline the problems that they faced, what were the requirements they had for the solutions they were going to pick, why they picked your project or why they picked Cortex and how they can uh, like what were the challenges they they faced and how they overcame them and what is like what benefits did Cortex or your project gave them. So we've we have a few case studies. We have actually three more in the pipeline that I'm going to publish. Um, and these are super useful because turns out other people read the case studies. So the first one we did was Gojek. Uh, and we have a couple of users who read the Gojek case study who are struggling with Influx as well. So they so they read the thing and they're like, oh, this is great. Cortex works for an actual company. And here's an end user case study. And we've done a couple more by the after that. And we're, we have a couple more in the pipeline. And they are really, really useful. So if possible, if you have a very interested end user, do a case study with them. Having said that, make it really easy for them. So essentially, if you ask an end user to write a case study, it most likely won't ever happen. So what we do is we jump jump on a call with them. We have a technical writer uh, interview them uh, based on a template that we create, uh, we record it, and then we actually do the write up ourselves and then share it with that company. Once the end user has sign off from legal, we, we publish it. So this way, all that the end user has to do is jump on a call for an hour and talk about their journey, which most people are happy to do. So yeah, if you can, uh, do interviews and write up case studies uh, for approval yourself, do that. That would be much easier for the end users. And your first case study, like having one case study is actually much, much better than having no case studies. And if you already have companies that you're working closely with, uh, try to use them for the first case study. One caveat is make sure that the case study is approved by the company's legal uh, and legal team before uh, before you do the case study because sometimes the person who's who's running your software might be really interested uh, to do a case study but it might not have the right approvals cool yeah and continuously encourage your end users to submit conference talks and to write blog posts End user talks are much more appreciated, have a lot more nuance than vendor or maintenance talks. So again, uh, I want to reiterate, if you have a Cortex one-on-one -on -one deck ready, that would also be super useful for end users. It'll just reduce the amount of time they put in. Cool. To sum up, um, have a good documentation and a good website. Make the project really, really easy to run. Um, be accessible uh, to your users, especially in the early days of the project. Uh, have a sync communication channel, have a community call, have office hours. And yeah, spend a significant amount of time, 20% even, uh, uh, to work on community and outreach, write blog posts. This is how you're going to get adoption. Work closely with a few users uh, to refine your product and your features. Uh, and this is like these users will become champions for your product in the future and that will drive more adoption. And yeah, leverage, leverage the end users to generate more content and make sure to have some case studies. If possible, write your, uh, write the case studies yourself and then send it for approval after doing an interview with them. Yeah. Cool. Any questions so far? <laughs> 